on today's podcast. They think, well, it's a genetic disorder like Down syndrome or Fragile X, and so therefore there's nothing that can be done, especially in the autism spectrum world. And that's not true. We know that these are what we call epigenetic, which means they're mostly driven by environmental factors. The other thing is that people think that there's some sort of damage or injury in the brain of children or even adults with different types of disabilities. And in most cases, there is none absolutely at all. I mean, that's what makes them so mysterious. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Jen Rivas here, one of your co-hosts, along with my incredible counterpart, Dr. Emmy Brown. Today is going to be a special day. Get ready to unlock the secrets of childhood neurological disorders with our next guest, Dr. Robert Melillo, a respected specialist in the field for over 30 years. He's been a guiding light for children struggling with learning disabilities, from autism spectrum disorders to ADHD, dys dyslexia, and more. Dr. Melillo's expertise spans a wide range of mental, attention, behavioral, and learning challenges in both children and adults. As a clinician, university professor, brain researcher, best-selling author, and even a radio and TV host, Dr. Melillo's cutting-edge research has transformed the lives of over 1,000 children through his private program and Brain Balance Achievement Centers. His groundbreaking work on functional disconnection has become one of the leading theories worldwide, shedding light on the underlying nature and causes of these conditions. I just know this is going to be a fascinating conversation, so I don't want to hold back anymore. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Melillo. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you both. We're so excited to have you, Dr. Melillo. I'm going to get started, and I have to know what sparked your interest in going this route in the first place in terms of studying neurodevelopmental disorders, learning disabilities, and how did you become a specialist in this area? Yeah. I've always had an interest since I was in school in neurology. I found that neuroscience was my favorite course that I did the best in. And I also, you know, was very interested in the beginning of my career in kind of like a sports rehab type of approach. At the time, there really wasn't sports medicine. And I was, but I was interested in that as an athlete myself. And, you know, along the way, I wanted to, I was very interested in combining looking at neurology with some form of rehab. And so when I graduated, I got my subspecialty in neurology and then in rehabilitation. And then later I got it in neuro, neuro, uh, uh, neuropsych rehabilitation. But what also really sparked my interest was that my own, my own kids struggled with certain types of neurobehavioral issues. So, you know, 1995, I came back from a busy night working in my office at nine o'clock at night. I had three young children at home. I was already starting to lecture on weekends and do brain research. And there's a woman sitting at my kitchen table with my wife and she's crying. She, my wife introduced me and said, this is Denise. She, her son has ADHD or maybe autism spectrum. And she's been, you know, working with a while. She had a big fundraiser last night and that's where I met her. And I was talking to her about what you do because she's frustrated because nothing really seems to be helping. And so you know, I said to my wife, okay, you know, I, I see what you're doing here and it's nice that you want to help, but I'm already kind of pretty busy. And do you really want me to take on this? And she said to me, I don't know why, but I just feel like you're supposed to do something with this. Hmm. So of course, wanted to please my wife. I started looking into it and, and, uh, about two, three days later, I went to my son's, uh, first, parent teacher conference. He was in first grade. He was six years old. And as soon as we sit down, the teacher said, I don't know how to say this, but I think your son has some sort of attentional issue, like maybe ADHD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I first, I felt as a professional, I felt embarrassed, right? I was supposed to know neurology. I knew a lot about the brain, but I didn't recognize this in my own son. Like most parents, I felt like I was to blame somehow because I was working a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I heard my wife saying, you know, I think you're supposed to do something with this. So I believe in those things. And I said, okay. So the first question that hit me is, 
what is it? What is actually happening in the brain? What's happening in my son's brain? Mm -hmm. And that's where it really started for me. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I tend to notice that it's always our personal stories that might lead us one way or another in medicine. And it really helps sustain us in that field and really add passion and drive. I can see that with you. And so just to set the stage, what are some misconceptions or myths around learning disabilities that you often encounter and you'd maybe like to dispel now? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think one of the biggest ones is that they're genetic. Most people don't know what they mean when they say that or when they hear that. The average person in the public, you know, thinks that there's some sort of genetic mutation or a bad gene. And therefore, you know, many professionals believe this. So therefore, they also believe there's nothing that can be done, right? Because they think, well, it's a genetic disorder like Down syndrome or Fragile X. And <clears throat> so therefore, there's nothing that can be done, especially in the autism spectrum world. And that's not true. We know that these are what we call epigenetic, which means they're mostly driven by environmental factors. The other thing is that people think that there's some sort of damage or injury in the brain of children or even adults with different types of disabilities. And in most cases, there is none absolutely at all. I mean, that's what makes them so mysterious is that when we look at a typical you know, image of a brain of someone with autism or ADHD, it really doesn't look that different. And there isn't anything clearly damaged or injured in any way. The other thing is that people feel like, well, you know, they're deficient in everything. And that's not true. As a matter of fact, one of the first things I found when I was looking into this was this concept called unevenness of skills, that kids with ADHD and other disabilities are not behind or delayed in, in all skills. And a matter of fact, they're often advanced and gifted in certain areas while struggling in others. And so that right off the bat, you know, sounded to me like some sort of imbalance going on. And so I think, you know, for me, I always tell parents that these issues almost always start with a gift, that there are areas of their brain that are, that are actually too strong. And because of that, other areas of the brain may not be able to catch up or may not be able to integrate. And that is the root cause of virtually almost all developmental disabilities and even mental health issues in adults. And I'd love to dive into that and we'll get there. But before we do that, just so we can set the parameters for folks who maybe are not as familiar, practitioners in particular, what are some early signs that a child might be struggling with a learning disability and what really defines a learning disability? If we can put it into a box, and although every individual is unique, of course. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, I think it's important because I like to use real functional measurements and look at objective data as much as possible. Um, but one of the earliest signs to me is really looking at motor milestones. I mean, movement is the fact that a living thing moved under its own power is why we have brains on this planet. My first book looked into that. So movement is what created brains and movement is what develops brains. A child needs to move to engage their senses, to stimulate the brain, to cause it to grow. They need it to calibrate it to the world around them. We're born with kind of the software in our brain and we need to calibrated by moving and engaging our senses. Anything that deviates from normal motor milestone movement is going to alter the way that the brain grows and develops. And so, you know, we have recently CDC came out with guidelines that change things and even said that crawling isn't a actual milestone anymore, which is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you know, there are, there are more political reasons for that than, than actual real reasons. But the bottom line is movement and how we develop movement and what, when they crawl and when they walk, those are really important. And they're really, I look at them as even narrower um, than what other people may look at, or even what the normal guidelines are, which are now expanding dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, as far as a, a developmental or learning disability, you know, if we look at behavioral issues, there are, you know, what we call behavioral checklists. There are, there's no real blood test or anything that can, you know, quantify it like ADHD. 
Learning disability is a little different. We can look at academic achievement tests. A test called a Wyatt is what I like to use. The Wexler Individual Achievement Test gives us a snapshot into where the child actually is and where they should be for their age and grade and in various subject matters. So for me, that's if a child is below a certain point, essentially for me, it's if they're two grade levels or more below where they should be in any subject area, they have a learning disability. If you look at something like an IQ test or some other tests, you know, if they are at 30 percentile ranking or below, that usually qualifies them as having some sort of learning disability. Thank you for that. And I just want to unpack it a little bit further. Can you share some insights? I know you mentioned it's not always genetically charged, which is kind of a a myth, but what other factors play a role, environmental lifestyle, you know, that you find are are sort of the the big heavy hitters when it comes to uh, the neurological disorders? Yeah, it's, it's all the lifestyle factors. That's, that's pretty much what's driving this epidemic rise. You know, autism was diagnosed one in 10,000 30 years ago. Now it's actually one in 38. And those are real increases, meaning that only maybe 50% of that can be discounted because of improved recognition and awareness and, and diagnostic techniques. At least 50% is unexplained, which means that there are real increases, meaning there are more kids with these issues. Same thing with learning disabilities, same thing with ADHD, which is the leading childhood issue in, in the world. Um, all of them have been increasing dramatically. And, you know, we know that you know, there's no such thing as a genetic epidemic, right? So genetic mutations don't rapidly change things. And also most of the parents that of kids with ADHD or autism or even dyslexia themselves don't have a diagnosis. They may have similar features, but they don't have a diagnosis. So what we see is that the only way we can explain it is really through environmental factors and primarily lifestyle factors. And it's pretty widely recognized that the same factors that are causing an increase in diabetes and obesity and heart disease and cancer are the same lifestyle factors that are driving developmental issues in kids. Makes sense. Yeah. And I really want to touch on what makes your practice unique. So you have, you call them a Lillo method. Can you walk us through that, please? Yeah. I think what makes us unique is really starts with the understanding. You know, I get people that literally come from all over the world to my practice uh, every day and they've done a lot. They've been everywhere. And I work with a pretty severe population. Many of the the majority of what we work with is non-speaking autism, which are some of the most challenging cases at any age level, especially as they get older. And, you know, the first question I ask them is, has anybody tried to explain to you what's actually happening in your child's brain? And they look at me and they say, no, no, never. And I say, isn't that a little surprising, right? If your child had a heart problem or a kidney or a liver, they would spend a lot of time explaining it. They give you a diagnosis like autism or ADHD or dyslexia, and there's no explanation at all. And that's basically because most practitioners out there really have no idea what it is. I've spent 30 years researching this. And even now, we've published five papers in some of the top journals in the world just in this past year. We have the, uh, a very large randomized age match control double blind study looking at retained primitive reflexes and autism and looking at also hemispheric integration. And we're publishing all the data. So we have at least another four or five papers coming out for this year. I've published uh, close to 100 papers and I have, you know, eight best selling books. So I really looked at this from a standpoint of what can we do about it? How do we change it? Because it really starts with what is the problem and how do we change that? If you're not dealing with the core issue in the brain, then all you're really doing is just managing symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, the, the way we approach it, first of all, and understanding what the problem is, how we assess that and document it objectively, and then you know, the way we put a treatment plan together. But there's two foundational things that are really unique to my practice. One is the idea of retained primitive reflexes and the importance in that and how that alters brain development 
And then the idea that that usually leads to a hemispheric imbalance of different networks. And those two things in combination are really the core issue. And if you don't deal with both of them at the same time, you're not really going to correct them. And then how that impacts things like diet, nutrition, the autonomic system, you know, the, the gut, the immune regulation, how that impacts that is also, you know, part of that. But that is also related to understanding the brain and what is what is the actual problem. Mm. Obviously very involved. And I, I think you have training for practitioners. I hope so, because I know that listeners will want to know about that and we'll, we'll circle back. And you may have touched on this already, Dr. Melillo, but I'm wondering, you mentioned on your website, the key primary issue shared amongst the learning disabilities, behavioral disorders, such as autism spectrum, ADHD, is functional disconnection. And you mentioned it in the intro, Jen. Would you walk us through what that is? Sure. Well, again, as we said, one of the biggest misconceptions is that there's a physical mm. injury or something physically wrong. There isn't. And that's, again, why most practitioners that may be highly trained really don't know what the problem is because there isn't any obvious you know, physical issue or chemical issue in the brain. It really comes down to the way the brain functions, the way it develops, and the way it communicates. And so what we know is that in, in our area of research is really looking at the way that we get functional connections in the brain. So functional connectivity has really been the focus of all research in this area, at least for the past 15 or 20 years. And we know that, you know, that means that there's no physical injury. There's no one spot in the brain. It's really the way the brain and networks communicate with one another that is the problem. And normally, as the brain develops and the hemispheres develop, they form these functional connections, not physical always, but functional, where certain areas of the brain don't, aren't even directly com connected, but they communicate with one another, really more in a timing, synchronization, uh, brainwave way. And when there's a disruption of that, that's called a functional disconnection. And depending on what networks are disconnected from others, what networks are overactive or developed, what networks are underactive, may produce a whole wide variety of symptoms in every area in the body. But the underlying problem is this disconnection between these networks in the brain, predominantly between the two hemispheres of the brain. Oh. Mm. And I'm just, I'm curious, Dr. Melillo, is that demonstrated on EEG? I know you said you can't see this on imaging studies, but is there has there been anything in terms of EEG or any kind of measuring of those? Yeah, that's our that's research. Exactly. It's mainly using QEEG. Mm. I work with a great team of neurologists who, and one of them is has over 500 publications and one of the best in the world at looking at QEEG. And so, you know, because there are subtle but but significant differences in timing in the brain. Uh -huh. We can look at fMRI and we do, but fMRI is kind of slow and the brain is really fast. And the disruption of the communication is really in the millisecond time range. So the only thing that can really see that pretty clearly is looking at, you know, QEEG. There are other methods that might be able to like magnoencephalography or other things, but yeah, we, we look at QEEG and when you're looking at it properly, you can see these subtle differences in timing and differences in brainwave functions that we can document. It. Mm, very cool. And I imagine that helps the parents and the caregivers to see that data just to, again, understand the pathophysiology. Yeah. And, and we also use a lot of functional measurements that really show them, like, like I said, one of the things I like to use is what's called a Wyatt test. Because, you know, most of the, what we look at is what is the, what is the cause, right? And we look at the cause is really this maturational developmental imbalance where there, again, there's no damage or injury, but certain areas of the brain are maturing at a different rate than others. And that maturational imbalance is what causes this functional disconnection. So how do we actually document that? We can't. We can look at the brain and see brain waves and, and, and see that, but we can't quantify what's the maturation level of this, this network versus this network. 
But the Wyatt can really do that by looking at functional testing. And like, I'll give you an example. So we look at four subsets of the Wyatt. Word reading, which is a left brain function. We look at basic math operations, which is a left brain function. We look at reading comprehension, which is right brain. And math problem solving or reasoning, which is right. So we're able to look and see, you know, what is the right brain and left in reading and math and what are the age levels that they're actually achieving at? So I just had two kids today. I had one kid that was 11 years old. He's on the autism spectrum. And he is 11, but his word reading was 11th grade, six months. His reading comprehension was first grade, six months. Wow. It was a 10-year gap. He was five years ahead in his word reading five years below in his reading comprehension. That gap is the problem. If you look at his brain, it would look perfectly normal. Even with brain waves, we'll see differences in brain waves where it'll look immature in certain areas, but we see different brain wave frequencies. But when we, but we, but a 10 year gap is huge. I just had another kid, just the last child I spoke to the mother before I left. This child is mostly non-speaking autism. And he was five years old, five and a half years old. And he was able to do the Wyatt. And I was shocked when I saw this. He was actually reading, his word reading was at ninth grade level. He was at 16 years old. And this is a five-year-old kid. But his reading comprehension was also at first grade level. So this is a kid who's five and he has a gap of like seven years. Mm -hmm. Those are ways that we can kind of document it And it really gives us a window. So that's another thing when you're sitting down and show it to a parent. Like this mom was shocked because this kid doesn't speak for the most part. And most people think that he's cognitively deficient, that he's, you know, has an intellectual disability. This kid is a genius with his left brain. I mean, he's performing at a ninth grade level. It's in word reading. It's it really is unbelievable. And the mother finally was able to go, wow, okay, now I understand that he really is gifted. Yeah. I just got chills. Just you being able to give those parents that gift, because I imagine they're probably struggling and uh, I would, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. You mentioned some different methodologies and programs that you're currently using, Dr. Malillo, but I'm curious if there's any other cutting edge research or therapies that you're also utilizing to kind of gather some of this data for these kids and parents? Yeah, well, we use the QEG. We use it for diagnostic testing. A lot of these kids, you can't even do any objective measurements on. It really comes down to a good neurological exam. Mm -hmm. I just had, you know, two parents that were with me from Germany and uh, we went, we were about to examine their child yesterday. And they said, you know, we went in, we saw a pediatrician and she sat across the room, never touched our child and gave them the diagnosis of autism. Now, the diagnosis was accurate. But, you know, how do you do an exam where you never touch somebody, right? I mean, a neurological exam, a physical exam. You know, that doesn't mean that there's been not benefit to virtual consults and all of that. But for me, when I'm looking at a child, I have to do an exam, ideally. And so, you know, that is really important. And in many cases, they can't really do anything else. They can't do something like a Wyatt. But we use a lot of cutting edge tools therapeutically as well. So we we use things like lasers. We'll use transcranial alternating or direct current. We use TEN stimulation. We do things like, you know, chiropractic adjustments. We do a lot of physical training and primitive reflex activity and integration. We have virtual reality and video games that we use. We use vibration. We use smell. Smell is a huge thing that no one looks at, but yet it's hugely important in the brain. And we combine these things together, light, sound, different frequencies of music, frequencies of light. So all different types of things in combination directed towards specific areas of the brain. Um, to try to create this kind of functional connectivity in the brain. It's a lot going on. And I want to commend you. I've, uh, you know, I'm preparing for this. I did a lot of research on your website. I love your website. I got sucked in to your documentary, The Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families. And I literally binge watched season two 
Um, I highly recommend it to anyone listening. And we'll talk about where they can find that at the end, Dr. Melillo. But I was hoping you might be able to share. I, Sean's story is obviously the one that I saw. But is there any other story that you can share that really stuck with you after all these years? Well, yeah, the first season was a child named Aramis. Um, that's the first season. And that was, uh, you know, really pretty dramatic. Yeah, that that TV show, that web series that we did, which, you know, it's interesting because now we're over a million views in two months. We're the number one show on that network. And, you know, that 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 show sat around for five years and didn't have a place for it. But we did it as a way of kind of educating people and, and giving a window, even doctors and therapists. We, you know, we never go in people's home for the most part, right? Some therapists do, but for the most part, we do things virtually or they come into our office. And going into someone's home sometimes is shocking, you know, to really see what's actually happening. And when we talk about lifestyle, you have to look at their lifestyle. Like you have to actually look in the refrigerator and say, what food are you really eating, right? Because they're not going to tell you the truth, right? <laughs> what does their house really look like, you know? Like the first house we went into, you know, wonderful, beautiful people, but they were so dysfunctional mm -hmm. and they knew it. And that's why they were begging us to come and help them. Mm -hmm. And they also were really great because they did everything we asked them to do. But when we went in there, you know, they lived in a two bedroom apartment with five dogs. Mm -hmm. They had animal hair everywhere. It was stuck to the walls. The this child, you know, had a learning disability when they were younger. Right now, he really was struggling. He was 11. He was really struggling with behavioral issues and severe dyslexia, learning disability. But he was a very gifted artist. All the parents and the parents both were, too. And the mom was so concerned with him when he was younger because he used to bang his head and that she started sleeping with him when he was a baby. And now, 11 years later, she's still sleeping with him every night. The father you know, had ended up just staying up playing video games all night and he would fall asleep on the couch. So the animals took over their bed and obviously peed on their bed over a while. So they eventually threw out their bed and they couldn't afford a, a bed. So, you know, we came in and, you know, this is what we're faced with because there's a lot here, right? We want to, we have to change his brain, the child. But if we don't change the environment that he's in, we had to help with their relationship. We had to show them how to clean their house. They had all of this kid must have had 50 stuffed animals and they would complain about how he was on a nebulizer and steroids because he always had allergies. The diet and nutrition was horrible. And, you know, they, you know, the eating was terrible. They never exercised. All of them were, were pretty much overweight. So, you know, that was a really interesting story because in a matter of a few months, four months, we really completely transformed this whole family. Mm. But, you know, there, there's there's so many that we have. It's kind of hard to <laughs> pick one. In my book, Disconnected Kids and Reconnected Kids, we go through a lot of stories. Yeah. But, you know, we, we see miracles every day in our office. I mean, we get unbelievable results in the most difficult cases. And it's, you know, so rewarding it's really hard. I have an unbelievable staff, but I don't think any of us could imagine doing anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to clear my schedule tonight because apparently I got to watch season one. Because <laughs> season one is season one is really good. You're going to get hooked if you got hooked on two. Wait until you see one. I did. I did. I got to put it on my list. Okay. So yeah, they're, they're only about eight minutes, you know. So they're short little. You know, but they're it's pretty interesting. It's That's why it's addicting. There's cliffhangers. I bet right. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah, fascinating because you're walking into this home and and you're just like, whoa. I mean, it starts off. Season one starts off with the mom on the couch saying, "Our neighbor upstairs used to say someday he's going to grow up and kill you." Oh, she said that's what he would say. Someday yeah. he's going to kill you, and it was really interesting because you know that's where it starts, right? And and. And at the end, this kid is incredibly loving and the families are loving. And in a million years, you wouldn't think that that was a possibility. Oh, it's amazing. Gosh. Yeah. As you said, you never know when you start really doing that deep dive. And that makes me wonder what kind of history, if any, are you getting from the parents in terms of their own personal medical history? Yeah, we do. That's a really good point. We do uh, a lot, actually. You know, 
one of the things we we do a really extensive history, and I usually do it myself. And we dive into any patient, even if I work with adult patients, I'm going all the way back to their childhood uh, and looking at their developmental, you know, milestones and how they developed. I just had a mom and a and a son from Massachusetts that I was just working on both of them. And they both had very similar issues. He was like a small, like a a, a more extreme version of her. Mm-hmm. And she struggled with depression and chronic digestive issues and, you know, a number of different problems her whole life. And this child also was, you know, struggling uh, with certain aspects of academic, even though in certain aspects he was brilliant. And this was the thing. You see, one of the, the, the hallmarks, I think, for parents is that your child has these unevenness of skills, like they're really good at certain things, but yet they're really delayed in others. And that's kind of a clue that, you know, there may be this imbalance, there may be this kind of functional disconnection occurring. And, you know, that's where we're, you know, we're, what we're looking at. That's the, the key, the core issue. Mm-hmm. And what about laboratory tests? Of course, you touched on clinical assessment and mm-hmm. uh, the importance of a neurological physical exam. Of course, yes. that's becoming a lost art in many clinic spaces, right. unfortunately. But what about lab tests? Yeah, lab testing is very important, especially when we're dealing with the nervous system and the brain. You know, the my the course I teach now is is entitled Functional Developmental Behavioral Neuroimmunology. The understanding of how the brain and the immune system interact with one another is really an area that there isn't a, a lot of great research in that area, but it's starting to come out. And it's really important because, you know, looking at things like antibodies, against neurological tissue, like antibodies against the cerebellum or the basal ganglia or, you know, the myelin sheath around the nerve, around the nerves, that we can see that many of these antibodies are there, but yet they may not have fully manifested, right? Like you could have antibodies against myelin, but it doesn't mean that you have MS yet, but it may mean that you may have MS down the road if you don't do something about it. Mm -hmm. And So looking at these lab tests, looking at food sensitivities, looking at stool tests that can tell us about gut function and look at, you know, minerals, vitamins, give us a window into inflammation and what's happening in the, in the immune system. You know, the, the two parts of the immune system is TH1 and TH2 systems of the adaptive immune system. And really, I think the way that where modern functional medicine is moving is really being more and more specific. You know, people would give supplements and say, well, it's good for the immune system. Well, it might be good for one side of the immune system, but it may be really bad for the other side of the immune system. That again, just like balancing the networks in the brain is really the critical feature. Balancing out the immune system is really more critical than just boosting it or, or suppressing it. So lab testing is really very, very important because everybody's different. Their food sensitivities, their reactivity is different, what vitamins they need. You know, I think if you're not really looking at lab testing, then again, you're just kind of, you're throwing things out there and you have to do things in a directed way. You have to do things in a directed way in the brain. You can't just stimulate the brain as a whole and you can't just stimulate the immune system. You need to be able to do things in a very directed way. And so you need to use functional tests. So that's where functional neurology, which is with the brain and functional medicine really for me come together. I want to switch gears a little bit to the nutrition piece, Dr. Malillo, because you literally wrote the book, uh, The Disconnected Kids Nutrition uh, Plan Book, and you collaborated with a Grammy award-winning chef, if I'm not mistaken. So walk us through kind of- Also, yes, yes. Zach Zach Brown actually was the musician. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. Well, I just want to talk about maybe some of the highlights of the book and, you know, walk us through your your ideation and and why you created it. Well, we want to create it because no one really had written a book really explaining a lot of the metabolic issues from a neurological perspective understanding that, you know, if you have food sensitivities, if you have a leaky gut, if you have, you know, antibodies that are developing, how does that relate to the nervous system? And how can issues with the brain and the nervous system really be the underlying cause? 
and so I wanted to write that in the book and get that across and relate it to how does it actually relate. But then what we wanted to do was also, you know, give people recipes. We wanted to give them ways, you know, practical ways. We wanted to, you know, explain to them what what vitamins that they may need and what the vi- what vitamins do and what are the normal dosages that you might consider how to actually do an elimination diet and reintroduction and why you want to do that and why that's so important and how that may be one of the most accurate tests that you could possibly do. So, you know, we wrote that because we wanted to, you know, tie it in with everything that I had done before, really emphasizing the importance of diet and nutrition, but again, from a specific way and also trying to understand that not every, not every diet is going to fit every child and that it needs to be individualized and to give them resources and tools in which to do that. Makes sense. And I'm sure there's so many different options. I'm curious about the recipes. I love to cook myself and variety is really important when we talk about the microbiome and you don't have to get into the nitty gritty, but I'm curious, do you have any tips for parents and caregivers for adding in nutrient dense foods for picky eaters, which we so often times see in, in kiddos? Well, you know, one of the questions I always ask is why, right? So why are they such picky eaters? And one of the things that is really interesting is, as I've said before, we check sense of smell on every patient. And in most cases, especially kids with right hemisphere delays, they have completely absent or very, very diminished sense of smell. Or they might be hypersensitive to certain smells and completely not smell others. And smell in general is more related to the right hemisphere, which is more related to regulation and the parasympathetic nervous system. So a lot of kids, they don't have a sense of smell and they don't really have much of a sense of taste. So they choose foods by how it looks or how it feels in their mouth rather than how it tastes and smells, which is how most people do. And so they become very picky as well as, as you know, they might develop literally addictions. You know, if they have food sensitivities to gluten and dairy and casein, they may develop casomorphines or glutomorphines that are literally opiates that can literally get them addicted to these foods. And they want to eat them all the time, even though every time they eat them, they may flare up inflammation in their body and ultimately cause inflammation in their brain. So, you know, this is where it gets pretty tricky. And so, you know, again, being able to try to get vegetables into these kids often is impossible. So, you know, there are some really good, you know, books out there that talk about how to, you know, put them into foods or bake them into foods or be able to do that. But, you know, one of the main things for me is we have to change their brain and we have to change their sense of smell. And we do that by doing many things, but we also use smell as part of what we do. And in almost every child, at a certain point, the parents will come to us and go, they're eating foods they would have never eaten before. Mm -hmm. And now they're, you know, their variety. The other thing is many of these kids, they don't, they're so disconnected from their body. They have very poor interoception. They don't feel hungry. They don't feel thirsty. So if they don't get foods that they like, they literally will shut down and not eat for days. And people will go, well, leave them long enough. And if they're starving, they'll come and eat. Some kids won't. They literally will just not eat. And so, you know, understanding that, you know, we need to, we need to do things to change the situations Mm -hmm. and we need to respect that they may have food sensitivities and we have to find the balance between making sure they eat and eat fairly healthy but try to also try to avoid the foods that they may be, you know, hypersensitive to, even though that will change as their brain gets better. Yeah. Well said. It's a delicate dance. And, <laughs> but luckily it sounds like sometimes it just comes with time and the therapeutic inve- interventions. And I think yes. that's very ho- hopeful. Um, and so, and again, I kind of want to switch gears to the parents again, because you mentioned something really interesting. And I think that it's, becoming a bit of a buzzword is preconception care. You mentioned in your book, autism, ways to possibly prevent autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. 
using a preconception plan that you can recommend to parents. So I'm wondering how early should parents start this program before they're planning on conceiving and what does it consist of? Yeah, you know, this this really started because obviously I'm working with children with disabilities. At a certain point, parents will come to you and say, we want to have another child, but we're afraid, especially if they have a child with severe autism. Sure. Not that they don't. Obviously, they love that child and they value that child, and, but they're just nervous, right? Because it's a, lo- it's a lot. Of course. And so they said, you know, is there anything we can do? And I believe based on the science, based on, again, there are environmental risk factors. So, you know, it's impossible to really say that you can prevent something. But what you can do is say we can lower your risk of having a child with a, with a disability by identifying what are the risk factors. What are the things that will elevate your, you know, that we know that elevate the risk, like, you know, being exposed to pesticides or organophosphates. We know increases your risk by a couple of hundred percent. We know obesity, diabetes, heart disease. We know age is a factor. So, you know, we, we, cannot, we know this, and most of them, again, are environmental factors and lifestyle. So they're things that we can change, we can alter. And so, you know, that is where it kind of started from this. And, you know, what I tell people is I ran two marathons, and I trained for about a year before them. So... Obviously, having a child is much more important than running a dumb marathon. So, if you, but if you're going to train for a year to do something like a marathon, I think you should look. At, and again, this is both the mother and the father's responsibility because there's almost an equal amount of risk factors for both because the genes come from both. And what we see is that, you know, if there's DNA methylation or these epigenetic factors, they affect moms and dads the same. So, it's really important for a couple to look and say, you know, okay, we're going to, we're going to really plan this out. We're going to look and measure. And these lab tests really come in handy. You know, if they have, you know, different antibodies, they can, we can look at their immune system. If they have a lot of inflammation, if they have sensitivity to foods, we can maybe modify those things and reduce the inflammation and reduce their cortisol levels and inflammatory cytokines and, you know, all of that, we can do that beforehand by looking at measuring all of these things and then working to get into a functional goal, a functional range. Sure. Yeah. And I appreciate that you pointed out it's not just about this future mom or this this woman who wants to become pregnant again, but the male factor is just as important. Um, We had a fantastic podcast on male factor infertility. And I think just you know, not just the interest of a of, of a lot of women wanting to do the preconception care. Um, I think that's really what surrounds that conversation, and it's easy to ignore the male. <laughs> but thank you for pointing that out. It's so important. I hope that you know, couples are coming in. And now I'm wondering, once there is a child with uh, a learning disability, what do you think about is earlier always better. I, I heard that that's not the case. I mean, of course, any intervention at any point is better than none. But what do you see in terms of is there a benefit to earlier intervention in these cases versus later on? Yeah, I think there's always an advantage to earlier, but there's kind of a balance because, you know, when we're trying to get them to change, we want them to be able to engage in the process. Very young children, babies and very young children, obviously they're not engaging. Very low functioning kids can't really engage. So we have to do everything to them. And we, we can and we do. And, it's, and it works great. But, you know, as kids get older, they can do more. They can engage in the process more. And so neuroplasticity is really a byproduct of not only, you know, how frequently you stimulate the nervous system, but it's also the intensity, the duration. So I think if we get even adults, if people are motivated and they really can do a lot of things and they really work hard at it, that can compensate for the fact that they may not be as plastic as a baby who can't, but the baby is very young, but they can't really do a lot, right? So they can't really engage. The more they're engaged in the process the more dramatic the changes will be. So as they get older, 
they can engage more. And there's some advantages to that over a baby that can't engage. So, you know, that's why I would say it's never too late. It's never too early. We want to get the kids as early as possible, but it doesn't matter. I mean, the only thing is when we're dealing with some kids, you know, we may deal with kids that are 15, 18 and, and get into the twenties, the young adults right now, the rise in young adult autism, especially those that are non-speaking, is really one of the fastest growing areas. And, you know, those kids sometimes can be aggressive and that can make it very difficult because, you know, they're big and they're strong and, yeah. you know, it's hard to, same thing when you're working with a teenager, even with diet and nutrition, you know, to try to get them, you can't make them eat foods that, you know, they can just, they may not want to do it. So, you know, them being able to be part of the process is really important. You mentioned challenges in, in dealing with your patients. And I assume you and your, your uh, staff don't get the kudos you deserve. And just in watching the series that I did, it's interesting. The, the challenge I would think you face often is with the parents and maybe resistance or denial or ignorance how do you maintain patience and empathy in these situations while ensuring that you're still getting, you know, the child's best interest uh, with the treatment and on the journey? Well, you know, the reason why I wrote the books was really to educate people and to really give them as much information as possible and explain things and, and raise awareness. And because of that, you know, people that come to me are usually pretty educated Mm -hmm. and, the parents that I get in my practice, you know, they come literally from all over the world. Sometimes they come for, you know, months on end and the sacrifices they make is amazing and humbling in many cases to me, but that wasn't always the case when I was younger. Right. And I know that for younger practitioners that, you know, may not, yeah, people may not know or don't have a reputation. It's harder because you have to try to convince people. And as you said, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the parent, you need to be the example. You need to create a healthy lifestyle. Again, their lifestyle issues mainly driving this. So, you know, if you're really overweight, if you're unhealthy, if you don't exercise, if you eat terribly, you know, if you're depressed, if you hate your job, if your relationship's a mess, you know, we all want our kids to be healthy, happy, successful, have great marriages and relationships and be, you know, follow their passion and do great in a career. But we need to set that example. So a lot of parents forget that, you know, and I understand because they're so overwhelmed and it's hard for them. They don't have any time. So it's more difficult, but it's just important for them to understand that what they do matters. They need to be on the same page. That's a lot of the reason why we also did that web series to really educate people about, you know, how to manage all of this stuff in your life with a child that has a disability and you need to go for treatment for that. But how do we, you know, it it has to work all together. The whole family has to be involved. Yeah, that's key getting everyone on board. And I noticed, you know, there were several times throughout the series that you were trying to corral the whole team. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Also why, you know, using media like that, because a lot of people don't want to read books anymore, you know, Uh, people have a short attention span. So, So, you know, a lot of people read the book, but a lot of people don't. So we wanted to say, okay, how else can we reach people doing podcasts like this? What you're doing is great because this is, getting it out to people, but, you know, having a a short, you know, eight minute episode that people could actually pay attention to. That's really interesting. That was one of the reasons why we did that because it was just another way of really educating people in a way that was going to actually reach them. Yeah. Well, I think it will be very powerful for all those who watch it. So I wanted to make sure we circle back uh, to your program or I think it's a program. Tell me if I'm wrong. The Functional Developmental Behavioral Neuroimmunology that you're doing. I want you to share with the listeners a little bit more about that because if I'm not mistaken on your website, you mentioned this would be the last time you were doing this live. Yes. You know, I have a lot of other things happening and I've been teaching this course in, in different iterations for, you know, probably 25 years. So this, I think, is the 
the ultimate iteration of what we wanted to create, really bringing in cutting edge neurology, immunology, functional medicine, functional neurology with, you know, real practical tools in every aspect. And we, we tried to really organize it as, you know, as best we went back and kind of looked at many years of me teaching and saying, okay, what were the greatest hits, right? Like if we had to pick, you know, this one we did in Atlanta, this one we did in Oslo, this we taught in Italy, you know, like where, where we, did we really, how can we put it together in the best way possible? And one of the people primarily teaching it with me is Dr. Peter Skyer, who is also what I think one of the top experts now in neuro, in, in, in neuroimmunology and functional medicine. He's really really on top of his game. And he's been working with me for many years. So we have that course. It's a fellowship course for healthcare practitioners. It's a certification course for people that are non-healthcare practitioners. It's 10 modules. Right now it's being taught in New York at the TWA hotel in JFK, which is really a super cool hotel that they renovated that that old TWA. There was a, a very famous architect that built the TWA terminal. And that company went under. They were the largest airline in the world at one time, started by Howard Hughes. And they had that terminal there. They couldn't do anything. And they turned it into a super cool hotel that is a throwback to the 60s. I love like you go that. Back there. It's really neat. And it's also, you know, for people that are flying internationally, it's really easy to come in to a hotel in the airport but it's also, you know, only about 15 minutes from New York City. So you just jump on a train if you want to get in there. So we have this course. We just started it. We're recording it. It will eventually be online. And again, there is a, a, a test, a certification test at the end of the course. But yeah, this is uh, probably the last time I'm going to teach this live myself. I may have other colleagues teach it, but I think this will be the last time I'll be doing it, you know, live myself. And there's a lot of hands-on stuff that we teach. And I try to give people, you know, all of my experience. And we also really try to put in some personal development. We put in business tools. We, you know, I've had pretty good success in all those areas. You know, I created Brain Balance Achievement Centers, which at one point we had 140 centers. We've worked with over 100,000 kids. So, you know, I try to give people, how do you build a successful practice? How do you build a successful business? How do you take this information and use it? Because, you know, that's the whole idea to help as many patients as you possibly can. Yeah. Sounds we're pretty fabulous. <laughs> yeah. And we're getting to that time, Dr. Melillo, where we're wrapping things up, but you mentioned some of the technology that you use in the clinic. And for those who are not familiar with functional neurology, I'd love you to walk us through what that looks like. I've seen just a little bit of it. Some of them look like arcade games and I imagine it's really to address sensory and or motor deficits or using those interventions to address other issues. What's your favorite and can you explain what it is and what it looks like for our listeners? Yeah, you know, the, the, the basic principles is that we have a big sensory motor component and that is the foundation, but we also have a big diet and nutritional component. And then we have a cognitive component where... We work academically with adults. We'll do more neurofeedback with some kids. We'll do neurofeedback, but we also do something called RPM, which is a way of called rapid prompting method, which is a way of helping kids that are non-speaking to be able to type on a letter board so they can start to communicate. And that's fascinating. I mean, we had this one child yesterday. He's five years old. He hasn't never said a word and he went in the room and just with a little prompting and by giving him feedback on his arm so that he could control his pointing, he typed out 50 words on his own. And yeah. his parents had no idea that he had any, that he knew those words, much less could type them out all perfectly. No. We use photobiomodulation or lasers. That's a really great tool. We have we use what's called the Avant laser. I created specific protocols to look at because we want to change brainwave frequencies. And we want to do that. And lasers, I believe, are a really great way of doing that. But we also need to do bottom-up therapy at the same time. So going directly to the brain or doing like neurofeedback or doing cognitive-based activities like academic training 
that's really what we call top down type of approaches that's going directly to the brain but we need to also build the bottom up so primitive reflex integration is probably one of the most powerful tools i've ever developed and we're constantly refining it but it is it is hugely important at every level i mean we have many adults that still have full blown primitive reflexes that you know have never gone away and primitive reflexes if people don't know these are things we're born with like the rooting and sucking reflex and grasping reflexes and startle responses and asymmetric and symmetric tonic neck reflexes. Mm. And they are there to help us engage and move and stimulate the brain so that we grow in the first year. But then by, at one year, they should all be integrated or, or inhibited. If they're not, they're called retained primitive reflexes and they impact brain development. They slow down brain development. And the right brain is developing first in the first three years. And if we have a delay, then the right brain may be delayed. If we get kids, let's say, that are very gifted with their left brain, it may come online too early. And this creates this imbalance that only gets worse over time. So uh, getting rid of these reflexes is critical. And if they don't go away year one, our research is showing they never go away on their own. You have to do something, even in adults that are 50 years old, they can still have all of these reflexes that go back to their childhood. Mm -hmm. And that has an impact because where these reflexes come from is the same area of the brainstem, the medulla and the pons that regulates gut development, that regulates the balance of parasympathetic and sympathetic activity, that regulates the innervation of the immune system and the detoxification system. Mm -hmm. So if those reflexes don't go away, that area of the brain doesn't mature, then all of those other functions and systems can be significantly impacted. We do also have virtual reality and video games that are designed to focus on different functions and different areas of the brain. Like I said, we also use neurofeedback. We focus on looking at what, what's called Broadman areas. Broadman areas are specific areas that have been mapped in the brain. And we target these areas with lasers, with transcranial units, uh, with, with neurofeedback. And so, you know, using it's, it's really a combination of all of these things in different, in different ways. But, you know, these tools like the lasers are really game changers that have come out recently. Transcranial stimulation is, is also another game changer that, you know, we didn't really have 10 years ago. And they make such a difference now. But, you know, you have to work on the physical component and the sentry and the motor as a foundational. If you don't work on that, those other tools don't work as well. That's helpful. Yeah, so many tools. I'm so grateful that we have those at our fingertips now and you're you're helping get the word out. So before we let you go, Dr. Melillo, you are obviously extremely prolific in your work. We talked about one of your training courses. Any other resources that you'd like to share with patients? parents, practitioners? Yeah, well, my, my Instagram is very active. I have over 500,000 followers and we try to use that as an educational platform as well. So I am constantly putting up videos and demonstrating things. And on that, also people can access my research papers and they can access our, our uh, web series. So that's, I think, a really good resource in this day and age. Facebook as well, but especially Instagram. So that's at Dr. Robert Melillo. And, you know, my, my website, as you said, also has a lot of these same resources there. Uh, the books, of course, I wrote them all as tools, not only for parents, but also for practitioners. They can really be used. They have exercises, they're manuals. They show you how to do things. They show you how to test things. And they're really great tools. And as well as, you know, the papers that we have. We have many papers and a lot more coming out, but they're really great resources that really educate people and even parents. I mean, we get a lot of parents that we give them those papers on the first on the first visit and you think that they wouldn't read them, but a lot, but most of them do actually. And even if they don't read them, they, they like to know that you're actually doing cutting edge research and you're not just saying things, but you're actually proving it. So those are really good resources. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Malillo. It's really been a pleasure. And obviously your work is groundbreaking. And 
I'm so excited to hear that you are continuing to do this very important work. So thank you so much for being here. And before we let you go, we'd love to learn about you a little bit more on a personal level. So are you game to answer our three rapid fire questions? Uh oh, yes, sure. <laughs> Why not? Smiles, who cares, right? So we're okay. good. Let's do it. We'll have some fun. Uh, first one: What is your favorite breakfast? Uh, I like good old fashioned, like eggs and eggs and sausage and bacon and like a cheese and Classic. bacon. Omelet. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> okay, okay. And then, what about what song has been stuck in your head lately, or what's your go-to music genre? I like a lot of music, but I, I like my 70s rock is kind of my thing. That's what I grew up with. But I have to say, it's a little shameless. My daughter is a singer songwriter <laughs> and Zach Brown produced her, her album. Amazing. And she's opening for him on some of his shows, one show here in New York. And she just came out with her first single and it's called Penny Lane and it's, it's on Spotify and it's actually doing really well. But that's my favorite song right now. Oh, it makes I love sense. It. What's her name? Let's shout it from the rooftops. Ellis Melillo. So same last name, Ellis, E-E-L-I-S. She's an incredibly talented singer, songwriter, and uh, she's been doing this her whole life. And so, yeah, so she's got some really cool songs coming out over the next couple of months. That's beautiful. I'll, I'll check it out. Yes. All right. Last question. Uh, if tomorrow, now it's a little heavy, I know, but I'm, I'm, Curious minds want to know, if tomorrow was your last day on earth, how would you spend it? I would spend it doing what I do. I would go in and work with kids and do as much as I could to really help them. I'd also try to spend as much time with my family, but my son actually works with me now. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I've thought about this recently because, you know, I, I did have a health scare at one point and I thought, what would I do? And I thought, I really wouldn't do it, change anything. I would still be teaching. I would still be treating my patients. And because, you know, I love what I do. There's no more. I mean, I'm in my purpose every single day. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that I could imagine more important than helping, you know, children with disabilities. When you can get a child that would maybe never speak to speak yeah. and what that does to the families. I mean, I would, I would spend every moment I could doing that because uh, if I couldn't, that would be a shame. So I really, I really would do what I'm doing because I love it so much. And I feel like it's really important. I love that because I know people search their whole lives trying to find their purpose and the fact that you are doing it every day that warms my heart. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for sharing your expertise. I know you already mentioned your website and your Instagram. We'll make sure we have that in the show notes for those that are listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Malillo. Thank you for having me. This was great. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.